Hello everyone and good afternoon. First, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Stephanie Woodworth. I'm a white settler woman with English and German ancestors living on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg. My drinking water is from Odewa and my water body is Ottawa River. I'm from Dryden, Ontario, which is located in the territory of the Anishinaabeg in Treaty Number 3. Dryden is situated upstream from Grassy Narrows and White Dog First Nations, and the communities are connected by the English Wampagoon River system. On October 3rd, 1873, Treaty 3 was signed, defining the terms of how the land would be shared and the nations would coexist. But the treaty was never upheld. The settlers aimed to dispossess Indigenous people from their territory to make productive use of the natural resources. The Dryden Paper Mill was constructed alongside Wabagoon Lake and Wabagoon River in 1908. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, the paper mill, owned by Reed, dumped mercury into the English Wabagoon River system and the site continues to leak mercury today. This has generational impacts on Grassy Narrows and White Dot First Nations, as well as other First Nation communities in Wabasemon. The communities are suffering from the slow violence of mercury poisoning and my hometown community of Dryden is responsible. I first learned about the mercury poisoning in these communities during the first year of my master's degree at the University of Toronto. I was born and raised in Dryden for 18 years and yet it took me coming to Toronto to learn about what happened as a result of my hometown. And so it was critical for me to learn more and I dug deep into the news, media, and academic literature to ask, how do the people of Grassy Narrows and White Dog First Nations become displaced, dehumanized, and unimagined? And how do we make the slow violence in these Indigenous communities visible while challenging the privileging of the visible white settler community of Dryden? To answer these questions, I'll trace back the history of slow violence in Grassy Narrows and White Dog First Nations by examining the settlers' ability to dispossess, momentum to dispossess, legitimacy and moral justification of dispossession, and their management of dispossession. In the 1850s, settlers arrived in the traditional lands of Grassy Narrows and White Dog First Nations to conquer and control the empty lands, based on the notion of terra nullis. The entangling of the logics of profit-seeking, land ownership, sovereignty, and governmental rationality creates a complex field of power that marginalizes Indigenous communities through resource extraction. Beginning production in 1913, the Dryden Mill was the first craft pulp paper mill in Ontario and only the fourth in Canada. The mill brought many settlers to the area in prospects of a new booming industry. Production ramped up in the 1950s when settlers transformed the English Wabagoon River system with dams. The landscape transformed from a natural river system flowing between and among communities equally to a constructed channel diverting water from the powerless to the powerful. While the dams physically divert water, they also imaginatively divert attention away from Grassy Narrows and White Dog First Nations and towards Dryden. The hydro damming flooded and destroyed sacred sites and wild rice beds, which were historically significant cultural places and sources of traditional foods and medicines for the First Nations communities. Through the national discourse of development, the state actively imagined Dryden as a settler community of productivity, civilization, rationalization, while Grassy Narrows and White Dog First Nations became actively unimagined as a community of unproductive, uncivilized, irrational uninhabitants. In the 1960s, settlers forced the First Nation people from their land to a new territory on Wabagoon River using a rationalizing logic of forest removal and resource theft. Many children were taken from the community and forced into residential schools. The state permitted corporations such as Weyerhaeuser access to clear forests in the territory for development, which further destroyed habitats, food, water, and significant sources of traditional medicines. The momentum to dispossess was fueled by the settler's self-interest of exploiting the land and natural resources for profit to excel in a new colony. The state allocated corporations access to the territory, which led to the dispossession of Indigenous peoples. From 1962 to 1970, the Dryden paper mill dumped approximately 10 tons of mercury into the English Wabagoon River system, but it wasn't until 1969 
when the mercury in the river was first identified, or 1970 when the government ordered the mill to stop dumping mercury. Following the government's order, employment rates in Grassy Narrows went from 90% to 10% almost overnight. Finally, in 1975, community members were first diagnosed with signs of mercury poisoning by Japanese researchers. To justify colonialism, settlers emphasized the differences between the civilized and the savage, creating a socio-culturally and spatially distinct other, intentionally unimagined from and within the settler state. The relationship between historical and modern processes of colonization and dispossession build the foundations for resource exploitation, which in turn underlays the socioeconomic conditions of such colonized spaces. Overall, through the creation of the reserve system and residential schools, Indigenous peoples were transformed into the other in a distinct their space, away and unimagined from the here of white settler society. In 1979, a deal made between the Reed Paper Mill and the Ontario government facilitated the sale of the mill to help protect the future owners from the accountability of the mercury contamination. Furthermore, a report by the Ontario Ministry of the Environment demonstrates that the provincial government encouraged Reed to sell the mill when the owners were being sued by grassy neuros. The government and industry wiped their hands clean from the responsibility of the contamination and placed the onus on taxpayers to pay for the monitoring of the river as it was deemed to be public interest. The management of dispossession thus relies on a set of disciplinary technologies. First, maps did not include Indigenous communities, which imaginatively and materially wrote the people off the land. Numbers were and are still used to replace local Indigenous knowledge with scientifically Western-driven data, and the law and the tools of law, such as prison, fines, and property rights, were and are still used to reinforce and justify dispossession. Contamination-heavy projects such as landfills, pulp and paper mills, and petrochemical facilities are disproportionately located in low-income BIPOC communities and are linked to health issues such as asthma, cancer, and birth defects. Because these same communities lack social and financial and political power, their concerns are diminished and silenced by the state and private corporations. Here, the poor are both physically and unimaginatively dispensable citizens, people who are expendable for the purposes of national development. Dispensable citizens can become dispossessed without moving due to the loss of land and resources caused by slow violence. Indigenous peoples have resisted the slow violence of logging and mining since settlers have arrived. Their resistance and struggles against the settler state as well as their resilience, survival, love, and hope for a better future have only grown stronger over decades of fighting. The entanglement of colonial and capital powers and ideologies facilitate the dispossession of grassy narrows and white dog first nations and the emergence of a new non-human or lesser than human geography, which has become their most pervasive confinement. The relationship between the settler and first nation communities, space and cultural difference, illustrates how otherness is constructed and how the other becomes objectified, unimagined, and dehumanized. The active unimagining of grassy narrows and white dog first nations is a production of the active imagining of Dryden as a settler human community. Settlers actively constructed the imagined us of a white civil human society and concealed the unimagined them of a savage, uncivil, non-human world. Indigenous peoples are continually dispossessed and dehumanized through the construction and the reinforcement of otherness in a distinct, unimagined their space. Despite the ongoing historical traumas, violence, and dispossession, the communities remain deeply connected to the land and water. So they fight for the cleanup of the river rather than fight for a new or different piece of land. It is not a viable solution for the community to relocate and they will not be forced off their lands again. As a white settler who was born and raised in Dryden, I was ignorant to and uneducated of the injustices, violence, and suffering of Anishinaabe people due to the actions of my ancestors and community. My family and I have benefited and continue to benefit from the colonial system that dispossesses and dehumanizes Indigenous peoples. I am responsible for my silence, but I will no longer be silent.